I want to uh, start the uh, the lunch program that we that we have for you. If I could, we've had uh, we've had one one request which I wanted to just explore with the group. Um, John, where's John Hirsch? There's John. John John brought to me uh, uh, our. our a request that would we as a, as a group be willing to endorse the renewal of uh, the Opportunity Scholarship Program in, in Washington, D.C. that just, it just passed the House this, uh, uh, this week, a couple days ago. Yesterday, Yesterday. Yeah, the days are all running together. Uh, and I, I just wanted to just take a, a few minutes and see if there's a general consensus that that's a good idea. Yeah, because John, I think John, John's feeling is that having a group that's, that's wide and diversified and on the West Coast a, express, uh, you know, uh, an opinion that, uh, that supporting this scholarship program in D.C. Uh, uh, would be helpful. Sure. Say, is this turned on? Yes, I guess it is. Hi, that's uh, me again. Um, basically, what I was hoping was that we could pass a resolution just supporting uh, H.R. 471, which is the program that the House voted through yesterday that's going to go up to the Senate. So it's a very current issue. And exactly, it is absolutely true that um, it's often talked about as a local issue in Washington. And to have a group that this meeting in California um, pass a resolution supporting it could very well be a help. I know the White House's statements weren't particularly helpful. But Obama hasn't said that he'd veto it. And even within the Senate, I think other things are possible, too. Just one or two quick points about it. What I meant it, what I said earlier is that, that I don't see Catholic schools as opposed to charter schools at all. I don't see them as identical either. But the, the uh, HR 471 takes that into account. The resources that it makes available are divided. They're limited to Washington, DC. There should be such a program in, in many cities. But it divides the resources equally between Catholic schools, charter schools, and public schools. So that, in other words, it, it, sort of, it deals with one or two of those issues sort of very effectively. Um, uh, what I had for just for the resolution was something like this. Well, I, I, I think we oh, just sorry. need something that, that's oh. really simple, simple, like we support uh, House, okay. House Resolution, is it 473? 471. 471. Uh, I, I'm thinking of something really okay. direct and, and, and straightforward. Any, any objections to doing that? Okay. I, good. Thank you. Um, the, our, our lunch speaker brings a, brings a very uh, distinguished record uh, to us um, today. Uh, Michael McConnell was known as one of, the, one of the nation's top judges until he stepped down from the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit uh, to join the faculty of Stanford, <coughs> excuse me, Stanford University in 2009. Um, he is the Richard, Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law, and he directs the Stanford Constitutional Law Center. Uh, perhaps, and, and um, Mike brought this particularly to my attention, particularly relevant for, for us in this room, is he argued the Rosenberger case and the Mitchell versus Helms case before the, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, very important uh, uh, choice cases. And uh, he right now is pro bono uh, uh, supporting the parents in, uh, in a charter school case in Minnesota that's being challenged by the ACLU. It's called a TISA case uh, where they're being challenged. They serve primarily a Muslim uh, community in, in Minneapolis area. And he's uh, involved in supporting those parents. Uh, he's, he's done an immense amount of other work on <clears throat> constitutional law and freedom of religion. And we're very grateful to, ha to have him speak to us today.
thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and it's been very inspiring uh, to be uh, listening to the panels uh, here today. I'm here with my, uh, my wife, Mary, and uh, both of us have been uh, interested in educational reform and especially educational choice for many, many years, and Mary also taught as a, uh, at a Catholic uh, high school in Utah, where we uh, lived until just about a, a year and a half ago. So it's been uh, it's been great to be here, and I appreciate the uh, the invitation. I'm I'm going. This is a luncheon talk. You don't want a lot of detail, I'm sure. And what? So I thought I'd talk about something that I think is interesting, which is history. And the you can hardly talk about the establishment clause of the First Amendment without almost immediately getting into history. Already this morning, we heard references to to Mr. Jefferson and to the Virginia Bill and, uh, and so forth, and that's uh, almost inevitable. And when the Supreme, United States Supreme Court heard its first case about uh, educational choice, which was in 1947, Everson versus Board of Education, uh, there were two opinions. It was a 5-4 uh, decision. Uh, both the majority and the dissent uh, were filled with uh, discussions of history. And when thinking about this question, so the question that was before them was does it violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment for New Jersey, or in a particularly a New Jersey township, to provide uh, equal subsidies for transportation to get kids to all schools, whether Catholic or public, which happen to be the schools in the township, and under the statute, uh, any schools, public or private, secular, religious, uh, the state would pay for the cost of transportation. And the question is, does this violate uh, the Establishment Clause? And so both of the majority and the dissent turns to history, and what history do they turn to? They turn to a dispute that took place in 1784 and 1785 in the Commonwealth of Virginia over a bill which was proposed by uh, Patrick Henry, uh, which would have required every person in the Commonwealth of Virginia to pay a tax uh, for the support of religion, and specifically for the support of teachers of the Christian religion, which is to say clergy. Uh, the money would be used, it would go either to the salaries of the ministers or to the upkeep of the uh, religious buildings. And you got to choose which particular denomination uh, you would uh, support, so that if you were a Methodist, you could send uh, your money to the Methodist church, and if you were Episcopalian, you could send it to the Episcopalian church. Uh, but it was simply a religious tax, actually not that different from what we now have uh, uh, in, uh, in Germany today. Uh, there's an excited a lot of support and uh, cited also a great deal of opposition. The opposition was led by, uh, by James Madison and, uh, and, and particularly in the form of the uh, a, a, a petition that he circulated which was entitled uh, the Remonstrance Against Religious Assessments. And this document, fascinating document, is probably the, the deepest, uh, most profound statement of what the Free Exercise and Establishment Clause uh, ideas meant to the uh, founding uh, generation. and So it's not, I suppose, that surprising that the court would turn to this, but the court indicated that uh, they thought that this Virginia bill was almost exactly the same as providing free transportation for kids to go to schools, no matter what schools they were uh, going to. The majority said that the, uh, that the bill, uh, that the uh, First Amendment has the same objective and presents the same protection uh, that the First Amendment does, and then goes on to talk about this. And the dissent just said that the, uh, the New Jersey law and I'm quoting now, exactly, exactly fits the type of exaction and the kind of evil at which Madison and Jefferson struck. Now, I think this is 
bit puzzling because after all, um, the Virginia bill sent money to churches to be spent for clergy salaries and church upkeep for the purpose of advancing religion. The New Jersey bill sends money either to parents or schools, depending on how it actually went directly to the parents and didn't even go to the schools, to pay for bus rides in order to support education. And they said it's exactly the same thing. Right? This is really quite a, a remarkable um, a, a event. And ever since then, discussion of issues like educational choice have been haunted by the idea that somehow the framing generation, the Madisons and Jeffersons, were opposed to anything like what we would now call educational choice. And, and so we're making some kind of a departure. Right? That what we're now talking about is something that's new that requires a repudiation of the founding. Uh, did the court mention anything about education at the founding? No. So let's talk a little bit about this. And this, what I, I, this is a, a, a sophisticated group that's thought a lot about education. I don't know how much you know about educational history. Charles Glenn here has uh, taught me much of what I know about, uh, uh, about the subject so that there's at least one. But this story is so little known that I'm tempted to call my talk the secret history <laughs> of educational funding in the United States because the actual story is so different from what you might think from Everson versus uh, uh, Board of Education. Um, at the founding, there were, there were no public schools in any state, so the education was entirely private. Parents would pay, to the extent their kids were getting educations at all, uh, pa parents would pay for it. And then there was a certain amount of charity uh, uh, financing of education for the poor sometimes. As the 19th century dawned, uh, the school systems became a little bit more developed. Prior to that, it, typically speaking, it was the local clergyman who was also the school teacher. Just a little anecdote about that. Uh, uh, when Chief Justice Marshall was a little boy, John, uh, John Marshall was a little boy, his, his father, James, was not a particularly religious man, but he ran for and was elected to the vestry in his uh, county, then called a parish in Virginia, specifically because they were going to choose a new clergyman and he wanted to be on the selection committee so he could find someone with the qualifications to be a good teacher for his bright little boy. So, you know, education and religion were not separate. They were, by and large, under the same hands and entirely private. Uh, in the earlier part, early part of the 19th century, especially in the large cities, schools, schools grew up, but not yet public schools. So New York, for example, between 1800 and 1830, there were something like 13 different publicly supported schools in New York City, and all but one of them were operated by specific religious denominations. The, there was a Presbyterian school, there was an Episcopalian school, there was a Methodist school, there was a Quaker school, there were more than one Dutch reform school, there was a Baptist school, there was a Lutheran school, and there is even a Jewish school, publicly supported. Uh, in addition to that, an African, the African Free Society operated a school for, uh, for, for freedmen in, uh, uh, in New York City. All of these receiving public support in the form of tuition for, the, for, for, for families who couldn't otherwise afford it. Basically, these were private tuition uh, paying schools, but the state or the city uh, paid uh, tuition or helped support this tuition for kids who could not uh, uh, afford it. And, what, and, and this was a state which had expressly repudiated any kind of an establishment of religion. So the New York Constitution of 1777 
had repudiated any kind of an establishment of religion, and yet they had this system and no one regarded it uh, as a violation of the separation of church and state or as controversial in, uh, uh, in any way. None of the states with little establishment clauses uh, had any problem with systems of educational choice of this, uh, of this sort. Um, federal government, to which the establishment clause, clause applied, had very little role in education, uh, but out in the territories where they were the primary uh, uh, government, uh, they did support education somewhat, usually through the use of land grants, and invariably uh, the support went to public and private, including religious schools, and no one seemed to regard this as remotely uh, uh, controversial. In the District of Columbia, where the federal government also was the primary government, there were no public schools until 18, after, well actually the main ones were started in the 1860s, but the system uh, through from 1800 through, or through the founding of Washington through 1845 was one of entirely private schools, but with public subvention from Congress going again to private schools, including religious schools, without anyone thinking that this raised any kind of a constitutional problem. Uh, even Jefferson, Jefferson received a letter uh, when, when at, after the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, the, the, uh, here you have the, this Catholic city of New Orleans, that, and, and the, uh, uh, something like 24 of the 28 priests in New Orleans flee Upon, the, uh, uh, upon knowledge of the Louisiana Purchase, they are scared that they are now this little Catholic enclave in Protestant America, and they expected that this was not going to be good. Then they're scared. The Ursuline sisters uh, operate a school and an orphanage, uh, that now as they did then. They send this very interesting letter off to Washington, and they ask the president, you know, what's, what's to become of us in this Protestant America? And Jefferson sends them back a lovely letter um, and, uh, in French, by the way, in his own handwriting. Uh, and he first tells them that uh, they will, of course, be under the protection of the law and that there'll be nothing, nothing will happen to them that's bad. They'll be protected fully by uh, by American law and constitution. And then he says, and in light of the good works which you do, referring to the orphanage and the school, he said that he had no doubt but that they would be under the patronage of the government that they've now found themselves in. Patronage, which is to say uh, financial support. That's Jefferson's only statement that we know on the subject of whether it violates the First Amendment to uh, for government funds to, uh, to go to uh, uh, schools that are operated under uh, religious auspices. As late as the 1890s, the Supreme Court did not consider it to be a serious issue uh, that religious organizations operated uh, 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 social welfare activities. The, the case came up as Bradfield versus Roberts, happened to be a hospital uh, in the District of Columbia, uh, operated by a Roman Catholic uh, uh, order of nuns. Uh, and the court said, and, and this was challenged, the taxpayer money going to this hospital was challenged under the Establishment Clause. And the court said that it does not matter at all that this hospital was operated under the auspices of a religious denomination. Doesn't matter why not. Well, it's a complicated opinion to, uh, to parse, but the bottom line is, a hospital is a hospital, and when the state is supporting uh, 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 that kind of a legitimate uh, uh, social welfare function, it doesn't matter that, the, that it may also be uh, under the auspices of a, uh, uh, of a church. So the early 19th century history uh, of, of this was uh, uh, never mentioned, but I think it would have presented the, a somewhat different picture in Everson had the court reported that uh, it was common practice never regarded as an establishment clause issue uh, to have uh, this kind of support for, uh, uh, for private, including religious schools. 
But then you might say, well, maybe a little bit later. Uh, and we pay particularly in, a particular attention as uh, constitutional lawyers uh, to the Reconstruction period because it was then with the 14th Amendment uh, that the uh, uh, Establishment Clause and the rest of the First Amendment uh, becomes applicable to the states. The 14th Amendment providing, uh, as it does, that uh, now no state may pass any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. And so the privileges and immunities of the United States become applicable to the states for the first time. Well, what did they think about this issue then? Uh, well, the answer to this is as clear as can be because the same Congress that passed the 14th Amendment, sending it to the state legislatures for ratification, also passed the Freedmen's Bureau Act, which was the first major federal legislation uh, supporting uh, education, the first big education bill ever, Freedmen's Bureau Act, 1866, and what did it do? It appropriated large sums of money for education of the newly freed slaves in the South, and it provided that preference would be given to what it called benevolent associations, which is to say private charitable groups, uh, to operate the schools. And among them, the largest single contingent were missionary societies, some of them non-denominational, but certainly not secular, but also many of them denominational, so that each of the major Protestant denominations of America operated missionary society schools receiving government money from Congress, from the very same Congress that passed the 14th Amendment and sent the amendment to the states to, uh, 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 for ratification. Uh, never mentioned to this day in any, case, in any opinion of the United States Supreme Court. This is secret history indeed. I think maybe we should pledge ourselves not to let the word out, because if the word did get out, uh, you might think that, uh, that it, has some, it ought to have some impact upon how we think about the question of the legitimacy of, of providing uh, a neutral assistance to uh, uh, education, even when it's under uh, religious uh, auspices. Um, but the historical ironies actually go even deeper than that and more fundamental than that. All that really tells us is that they didn't think that educational, or the governmental support for private, including religious education, was, was, uh, was wrong. But I think it actually goes even more deeply uh, than that. And, and when you want to ask yourself, or at least I like to ask myself, you know, what was the Establishment Clause really about? What was it about? Um, and I think in order to appreciate what the Establishment Clause forbids, the best way to think about that is to ask why did the people who advocated the establishment of religion want an establishment? What was, what was the purpose of an establishment of religion? And if you answer, well, it's to advance religion, you'd actually get it wrong. The advocates of establishment of religion did not tend to be uh, uh, particularly interested in the question. Machiavelli, for example, in his uh, uh, discourses in the first 10 books of Titus Livy advocates that the prince support religion, even though he says, even if he thinks it quite fallacious. Right? Has Thomas Hobbes, most historians believe he was a, a, a one, of the, a one of Europe's first important atheists, and certainly not a religious man, uh, has a, a, a whole chapter of the Leviathan on why the church needs to be under the control of the state. And Hobbes's argument is actually quite simple and quite logical. The church is an important instrument for the inculcation of ideas and opinions, and the state needs to be able to control that because what, what Hobbes says is, is that people's behavior is shaped by the opinions that they have about the good and ill which is going to come to them, and that especially includes the good and ill of eternity. Right? And he points out quite accurately that when people are brought up to believe that God requires them to rebel against the king, they rebel against the king. He's, of course, writing what 
11 years after Charles I was beheaded by the Puritan re rebels in, uh, uh, in the English Civil War. Uh, the, and, and he says that unless the prince, the, the magistrate, the king, the sovereign, uh, controls religion, uh, that you're going to have a tumult and civil war. Right? Uh, Rousseau, and across the English Channel, writes essentially the same thing, that control over civil religion is necessary uh, in order to support the unity of the state. Right? So the Church of England was the ideal of an established church. That was what our founders thought of when they thought of an established church. Uh, what did the Church of England stand for? Well, it stands for a lot of things like you know, the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the Substitutionary Atonement and this and that, but uh, it, it conveniently has 38 articles, and one of the articles of faith of the Church of England was the supremacy of the king or queen over all matters spiritual and temporal. That is a very convenient article of faith if you're the king or queen of England, right? And that's, I submit, what it was all about, is that it is the control by the government of a major institution for the inculcation of ideas, opinions, uh, and values. And the same spirit which led to established churches also led to the licensing of the press. So that in England, you could not preach without a license. That is to say, you had to be a, a, a clergyman in this approved denomination with this wonderful uh, article of faith about the supremacy of the king or queen of England. And you also could not publish books or newspapers or pamphlets without a license from the king. And the purpose of those two institutions is identical. That is, it's to give the government control over the spread of ideas and opinions among the people. Well, over here, we weren't going to have either of those things, right? We do not have a government-controlled press. Even now, of course, uh, the, if you think of England, it, it, they're pale shadows of what they used to be, but the Church of England and the BBC are essentially the same idea, right? Um, we, o over here, we have neither one. Right, if you don't count the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, uh, and, or, or, don't get me started on NPR. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, over here, we were not going to have either one. We were not going to have a government-controlled uh, press. We were not going to have a government-controlled church. And they even voted down, although they did not make it unconstitutional, they voted down the idea of a government-controlled national university, which was proposed at the Constitutional Convention and voted down. We don't know why, but I suggest to you that it is of a piece with rejecting uh, a government-controlled church and a government-controlled press that we don't want government-controlled education uh, either. Right. So where am I going with this? Public education does not really come about in any states until roughly the 1830s. The first major uh, 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 public school uh, system is, is in Massachusetts. And in one of those lovely ironies, sort of like the Liberty Bell cracking on, uh, J on John Marshall's death, which is a myth, by the way, uh, um, but this one isn't a myth. Uh, the public school system in Massachusetts was put into effect exactly as the established church in Massachusetts was brought to an end. Right, think about that. And many people might say, oh, well, instead of having establishments of religion, we're, we're, this, we're going to have the opposite. But I think that that's actually not a very accurate way to look at it. The public school system wasn't the opposite of the established church. It was the continuation of the established church because what does public education do? It gives government control over the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, pub the, the training of children in opinions, values, and beliefs, right? Uh, it's not all about reading and writing, and if you read Horace Mann, it's 
you know, reading and writing and career preparation is way down his list of what education is about. It's about the formation of citizens. And we want to be certain that our young people are being brought up uh, in a way which is congenial to the government. Thomas Hobbes understood this. This is exactly what he, uh, uh, what he was telling us in his chapter on the Leviathan. Uh, and so here's the point that I would like to almost leave you with, and then there's a footnote. Uh, rather than the institution of educational choice being an establishment clause violation, educational choice is an antidote to the establishment, not necessarily of religion, right, but of governmentally controlled ideology. That if the whole impulse of the rejection of licensing of the press and the established church is because we in America did not want our government to be in control of the propagation of opinion, belief, and value. Right? The public schools are the great exception to that. They're a post-founding exception to that. And I would suggest that they are contrary to the spirit of that, and that when we open up the possibility of educational choice, so that parents are able to choose for themselves the values, opinions, principles uh, uh, that their children are going to be brought up in, that's very much like allowing them to choose the own, their own church. Then instead of having to have a, a go to the state-controlled church with its articles of faith, uh, and instead of having to go to the state-controlled schools with its articles of faith, each individual family is able to choose for itself. Now, one, I promise, only one footnote. And the footnote has to do with, uh, with when did these things become controversial, right? Because in New York, there was no controversy over the funding of the Lutheran schools and even the Jewish school and the African Free Society and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and all the Dutch reform and so forth. And in Congress, there was no opposition to having the Freedmen's Bureau uh, operate schools through the various missionary societies of the various denominations until something happened. And the thing that happened in, is that Catholics came to this country in large numbers. Uh, in New York, the Catholic population tripled uh, in the 1830s. Uh, and it was when the Catholics asked to have a school in New York that it became controversial. And at the federal level, here we are supporting all of these missionary society schools. Uh, and in 1875, President Ulysses Grant makes a speech to the veterans of the Army of Tennessee uh, in which he says that the prior divisions of this country are, are, are no, or the, the divisions in the future are not going to be based on Mason and Dixon's line. That is, it's not going to be North and South anymore, but it's going to be the forces of enlightenment on the one side and of superstition and ignorance on the other. Therefore, let us resolve not to allow any public funds to go to sectarian schools. Now, you may not know what the word sectarian meant to them, but Protestants are at least sort of lukewarm, non-denominational, non common, uh, 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 common ground Protestantism. That was regarded as a good thing in the schools and was being taught in all of them. Sectarianism meant the specific doctrines of a particular denomination, and the only one they had in mind was the Catholic Church. And so the, the constitutional amendment that is proposed goes by the name the Blaine Amendment, contained two features. One feature was no money could go to sectarian schools. The other feature was that there would be Bible reading without note or comment in the public schools. Again, not a secular amendment. That's not what it is about. And don't take my word for it. Read the legislative history, the debates in Congress over the Blaine Amendment, and they are as clear as can be. I actually brought them, and if I had time, I'd love to do a dramatic reading. But at one key point, the, the leading sponsor in the Senate of the Blaine Amendment, who's Senator Edmonds of Vermont, 
It reads literally on the floor of the United States Senate in connection with this constitutional amendment. He reads from papal encyclicals and he says, I'm doing this because I want you to understand what the real issue is, right? He wasn't reading Jefferson's bill. He was reading papal encyclicals and that is what the issue was for them, right? Now they want to tell us that it is an establishment of religion when anti-Catholicism begins to break down in some of the large populous states of the Northeast, like New Jersey. And they are willing to extend just a tiny portion of the school spending in the form of bus rides to get there are going to extend on a non-discriminatory basis to kids going to Catholic schools for the first time. And they want to tell us that that is an establishment of religion. What I think, what I wish they had said and what I believe uh, is that bills like the one in Everson, far from being an establishment of religion, were the first chinks in the disestablishment of religion in America. So thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have uh, uh, time for maybe just a couple of questions, but uh, Professor McConnell's also agreed to just uh, sit up on the next legal uh, panel and, uh, and maybe we can explore some of these issues a, a little bit more in the, in the Q&A then. But are there, uh, are there any questions right now? Let me uh, charge back here with the mic. Hi, I wonder if you might, um if you might say something about um, this idea that some people have, uh, Justice Thomas talked a bit about this in uh, Elk Grove versus Newdow, that the, this idea about the difference, well, basically incorporation, right? That there is a difference between incorporating the free exercise clause or the free speech clause, which are ostensibly designed to protect individual liberties. There's a difference between that and incorporating the Establishment Clause, which is about something much different. In many ways, I guess this is the, the point that you were sort of making, but I wonder if you might speak about that just for a moment. Um, this is a, so so the, the question is, when, when we're incorporating, is applying against the states the various provisions of the First Amendment. Most of the provisions of the First Amendment are about individual liberties, like freedom of speech, petition, assembly, uh, uh, and free exercise of religion, but establishment isn't quite like that. I mean, it, there are some individual liberty aspects to establishment. When coercive power of the state is used to force someone to participate in a religious exercise, that's an establishment and it's also an individual freedom. When people are treated, when one sect is preferred over another, uh, that can be seen as an individual freedom like equal protection for religion. But there's this other dimension of, uh, of the Establishment Clause, which is sometimes goes, the Supreme Court gives it the weird word of entanglement, which doesn't mean anything other than the absence of separation. I think that's what it is. But I think it's best understood as a jurisdictional principle that relig religion is not within the powers of the state. And so, uh, to, to, so I think we have a constitutional principle that to, as nearly as is possible consistent with other you know, uh, uh, aspects of, 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 of advancing the public good, uh, that the religious complexion of the country is going to be left to the people and not be decided by the government. That doesn't really pertain to any one person. It's not an individual right. And so an argument has been made that that was, doesn't fall within the principle of incorporation of the 14th Amendment, which is all about uh, uh, personal uh, uh, rights. Um, I think that's very plausible, might even be true. Um, there is, however, some historical argument to the contrary, it's best, it's best set out in an article by uh, uh, Professor Kurt Lash, now at the University of Illinois, called The Second Adoption of the Establishment Clause. Who, and he talks about the intellectual history of, 
of the idea of establishment between the founding and, and the 14th Amendment. And he presents a great deal of evidence, uh, and I'm not saying this is beyond a reasonable doubt, but a good deal of evidence that by the time of the 14th Amendment, the term establishment of religion had come to be used to mean individual liberty from the imposition of, of, uh, uh, of uh, religion, and to the point that several state constitutions uh, borrowed the language, no law respecting an establishment of religion uh, in their own state constitutions, which is pretty good evidence that it was no longer viewed as a, as a federalism uh, principle. So I think that there is at least a pretty good historical uh, basis for rejecting that otherwise plausible argument. That said, I should uh, confess to a little bias here because I believe in the non-establishment principle. I think that, it's, uh, that not having an established church is, uh, is, uh, is an aspect of, of uh, liberal democratic governance that I applaud. I just want them to get it right and, and exp because establishment is not about whether religion is advanced or not. It's about whether government has control over religion or not, right? And I don't want government to have control over religion. So. Uh, you, you remind me of a book about 30 years ago by Rockne McCarthy and others called Disestablishment a Second Time, which argued that we needed to disestablish the public school system. Not that we should stop funding it, it's not a libertarian argument, it's just that it should not be an establishment. I, I wanted to offer another example of, of your point. Um, Jefferson and Madison and other presidents funded uh, religious organization uh, operating schools among Indian nations throughout the 19th century until the anti-Catholic mood of the uh, late 1870s, when suddenly the Methodists and Episcopalians and all the other groups got very self-righteous and said, oh, we don't want to accept this money anymore. We don't think it's a good idea. Even though they'd been accepting it for 40 or 50 years, leaving only the Catholics getting the um, government money. At that point, we had the quick bear uh, ruling, which I'm sure you could explain better than I could. But, uh, you know, it's interesting that, that there was no problem about it until the Catholic issue arose. Mm -hmm. And upheld by the Supreme Court, as you say, in Quick Bear versus Loop. A great example. I, I, I'm sorry, it's just a quick question, but why d don't all the great Catholics that are here gather and sue based on the fact that the Blaine Amendment was anti-Catholic and establishes non-religion? Um, that's a very good question. And, and uh, Eric, do you mind if I uh, out you? Uh, I mean, we are, have sitting here one of the nation's maybe leading uh, masterminds of that particular litigation strategy. He's going to be on the next panel. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> Let me let me bring we're because well, I want to keep us on on schedule. So let me let me bring this uh, this lunch session uh, to a close. Give us about five minutes just to set up the next panel, and and uh, we can continue this discussion.